speaker is uh, Professor David William Gammon, Department of Chemistry, University of Cape Town, South Africa. His position at University of Cape Town have combined his interests in research and teaching in chemistry with broader interests in facilitating effective learning in the sciences and the challenges of transforming spaces and minds at University of Cape Town and beyond. He is a recipient of the UCT Distinguished Teacher Award. His current research focus on the synthetic and medicinal chemistry of carbohydrates and plant natural products. He is the South African representative to the International Carbohydrate Organization, the ICO. Uh, he would be speaking on a very general topic uh, today, good for the students, PG students, some UG students are also there. Reflection of a chemist during a pandemic. This is what his title is for today's talk. Uh, could I request Professor uh, David Gammon to please uh, start his lecture? Thank you so much. <coughs> uh, thank you very much, Professor Kare. Um, I assume you can hear me okay. Is that is that correct? It is fine. Yeah, perfect. Good. And my slides are visible. Yes. Yes, it is. Excellent. So uh, may I start by thanking you um, uh, very much indeed for the invitation to participate in this uh, wonderful seminar. <clears throat> it's it's an, uh, indeed a, a great honor and uh, to congratulate you and your colleagues on bringing this together and also to congratulate you and your university on the um, centenary that you are celebrating, um, which is uh, a, a great achievement for your, for your university. Um, so um, I have um, <clears throat> decided to, as uh, Professor Kare mentioned, to give a rather general uh, talk at this time. Um, this is partly because um, I am not uh, specifically involved myself in research related to COVID-19. Um, but what I thought I would do was uh, think a little bit about uh, the experience that we all have been through over this last little while. And I'm sure that like you, um, it has been a time for uh, reflection as we've uh, been in lockdown and <clears throat> isolated from colleagues and, and friends and so on. Um, and it is a chance for us to think back uh, over uh, our lives and uh, to ponder the meaning of things. And I suppose particularly for myself as I am approaching the end of my career, um, I've been able to look back and to think about what um, I have learned along the way and to <clears throat> slightly more broadly to think about what a training in chemistry, uh, how a training in chemistry equips us for life and for dealing with uh, major problems like a pandemic uh, such as COVID-19. So um, I'm going to give some reflections. I'm going to tell, uh, give, give you some of my th thoughts, but I also want to focus a little bit on some of the research that I've done, but probably not in great detail. <clears throat> it has been very interesting, however, to uh, listen to some of the other talks, and I'm, I'm grateful for that. So um, let me proceed then, um, and perhaps just quickly share a few thoughts to begin with about what the uh, pandemic has highlighted for me. And maybe you would share some of these insights uh, as well. Um, so it is, of course, as we all know, it's a really significant and a dominant once in a generation effect. We are living through a time uh, which is for most of us unprecedented. Um, and it is life changing as, as everyone has, uh, as others have noted. And we've also noticed that it's connected to other factors affecting the world. It's not the only thing we are facing. And this is, makes it all the more difficult because it's superimposed on various other challenges that different societies around the world are facing. And I'm sure your country, uh, India, is, is uh, finding the same thing. So secondly, I've um, been thinking about the fact that it, it does affect us all. And uh, in one sense, it highlights aspects of our common humanity. So we're, there is a sort of seeming contradiction here because it's keeping us apart. We are forced to isolate and separate and so on. And yet, in a strange way, it is bringing us all together 
globally. And uh, this very uh, w webinar or e-seminar that we're involved in is, is a good example of that. Um, and it's really great to be um, in, in uh, community with uh, colleagues around the world. Um, <clears throat> then thirdly, um, unfortunately, or in fact, perhaps fortunately, uh, it's also highlighted what I would call fault lines and inequality in society. So we can't help but look around us, and I think we're almost obliged to as citizens and as scientists. And we've noted, I'm sure you have in your country, and certainly in my country, South Africa, we have as well, it affects. The reality is that it's not affecting us all in the same way. It affects some people much worse than others. And so it, certainly I have found my awareness of inequalities uh, heightened and uh, also my resolve to try and contribute to improving the fortunes of others. Um, I, just as an example, uh, to, to illustrate this, um, I thought I would just show you two photographs uh, at the bottom of the slide here of uh, the city of Cape Town, where, where I live. Um, so on the left-hand side here is uh, the area which we refer to as one of the townships, Kailitsha, uh, where the poorer people live. And um, on the right-hand side is one of the, the more elite suburbs of Cape Town on the very beautiful coastline, <clears throat> uh, what's called Camps Bay. And Cape Town is a, is a city of a huge contrast. And um, the reality is uh, that there are some absolutely beautiful and wonderful uh, places to enjoy. Um, and uh, people who uh, have the resources to be able to enjoy that and there, yet there are many others who live in poverty and of course the COVID epidemic is particularly hitting the people in these uh, communities here um, much more in a much more devastating way than that. So, so these are challenges we, we simply can't ignore. Um, we have to contribute in the way we can to try to resolve this. Uh, but it's also been humbling, um, uh, there's been a humbling reminder of our place in the world and the fact that we are part of this uh, delicate planet. And um, we have seen, and I have a photograph here, of course, of the Himalayas, and I've read the reports coming out of India of people who are uh, catching glimpses of the Himalayas from their own homes and places like Delhi and in the Punjab and other areas, I suppose, um, where, where they couldn't see it for before that because of the um, a combination of the dust and the pollution in the environment. And in, in Cape Town, I've noticed um, here's our uh, iconic uh, Table Mountain and the, the city lying um, at the foot of it. And uh, we've certainly noticed the, just how clear and clean the air is here. And so this is a strange consequence of the, uh, the closing down of our economy. Um, or the slowing down of the economy. And it's a reminder of just what a delicate uh, balance uh, nature is, and again, of how careful we have to be. And I think as chemists and scientists, we, we have a particular responsibility to, um, to manage and to contribute to preserving the environment and to do things in environmentally sensitive ways. So this is another important uh, thing. And then I think lastly, just uh, in the general points, uh, it's highlighted, of course, and, and the very fact that we are doing this right at the moment, uh, that we are living in an age of very advanced electronic communications, and we're becoming quite dependent on these. Um, but it's, again, there's unequal access to this. Um, but it's also, I think, as we're all experiencing, highlighting that uh, we also need each other. And I suppose we're hoping that we will transition soon from this kind of existence here to uh, this kind of existence here, where we tentatively start encountering each other again. And then finally, uh, hopefully, we can get back to something like normal, where we can have uh, normal, warm human interactions with each other. <clears throat> so. Let me turn briefly then, before I start telling you some stories about chemistry itself, um, and I ask the question, what is it highlighted, uh, particularly for me, about science and chemistry, um, rather than just in general? Well, I think what we've all noticed is that science is absolutely central to understanding and managing the pandemic. Uh, the very fact that we can, that we have images like this of the coronavirus, and the extent to which this is being studied and understood, uh, is quite remarkable. And the fact that um, uh, many countries around the world um, 
are basing their response very strongly on science. Um, certainly in my country, South Africa, we um, have had quite an impressive uh, record in our government of uh, basing decisions and advice and so on on a scientific understanding. Um, we also daily look at statistics. Here's our very recent picture in South Africa. And of course, we're reliant on statisticians and epidemiologists and so on to provide us with this ongoing monitoring of the situation. Um, and so science is, is playing a, an incredibly important role. Sadly, in some places in the world, it's not being respected as much. And I think what we're seeing now is the, the cost of that uh, if, if the scientific understanding is, is ignored. But it highlights then that scientific education is absolutely vital. Most of us here are either involved in, in education and in university teaching and research, or you, you, there are many of you I know who are students. And um, you really have to treasure your scientific education and spread it to others. There is, as we've found and as, as we've seen, a tremendous amount of ignorance, prejudice, intolerance. And we need, in fact, to teach people how to think and how to deal with complexity, how to evaluate evidence and assess risks, how to listen to different perspectives and to allow understanding and insight to determine behavior. So uh, we in the universities need to evaluate our own um, uh, education and what we are offering students against these ideals. Are we, in fact, achieving this? Thirdly, we think of chemistry, uh, most of us, I think, as an exact science. We, we kind of pride ourselves on uh, precision, uh, very careful measurements, observations, accuracy. But the reality is we don't know everything. There's a tremendous amount we do not know. And science can sometimes, sometimes doesn't have clear, unambiguous answers. So we need to accept this, that our understanding is partial. And sometimes we need to acknowledge that. And we need to learn how to live with uncertainty. Um, I used to have a, um, a, myself and my lab colleagues, when I was doing my PhD, we used to have a sign on the wall which said, unanswered questions go this way, unquestioned answers go that way. And we needed to remind ourselves that we were looking for answers, uh, but we also, when we got the answers, we need to actually question them, interrogate them. And this is part of the, um, the, the development of good understanding in science. <coughs> um, we, we also, I think, have, are learning that we can't go it alone in our research. We need to collaborate, share ideas, resources, and, and harness our collective efforts. So the, 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 the pandemic is highlighting this. Um, there's no single person or even a single institute that is going to solve the problems around COVID-19. We desperately need uh, increased and more effective collaboration. And then finally, um, I think as I've uh, wanted to emphasize overall, um, as I've thought about my own life in chemistry and in science, I've realized that a training in, in research in chemistry has an, indeed a very high value, it, both for the specific knowledge that it uh, brings us, and we've heard some of that um, in the talks, uh, the, the detailed understanding of things, but also the generic skills that we have acquired and which add huge value to us as individuals and to communities. So um, the, I think we can be profoundly grateful for this and in a sense recommit ourselves to the value of, of this kind of thing. So let me move on from those general comments to then ask uh, what do we learn from chemistry or what have I learned from chemistry, um, which is relevant to the pandemic we're uh, living in. And I'm going to tell you a few quick stories um, of uh, my personal journey and try and uh, draw out the, uh, a few lessons. <clears throat> and I'm hoping that, um, that the, uh, the younger people listening in here as well will take uh, um, some encouragement from this and uh, that it will help you on your journey as you develop further. So, um, Let's see if I can get the next slide here. I uh, seem to have slowed down here. Ah, there we go. So I'm going to go back over a couple of um, things in my own research career. Um, and as uh, Professor Kari mentioned at the beginning, part of my uh, research interest has been in carbohydrate chemistry. And as I look back, I can select several highlights. I just want to highlight one here 
from a paper which we published in 2005 in collaboration with uh, Stefan Oskerson and other colleagues and students. And um, this involved uh, the um, synthesis of structures corresponding to the capsular polysaccharide of Neoceria meningitidis, group A. And the efforts here were directed towards a uh, glycoconjugate vaccine against this very um, important and serious pathogen, particularly in Africa, it affects children uh, quite badly. And this, um, I suppose I highlighted this, uh, first of all, because it was my first encounter with um, work directed towards vaccines. And as we know, the preparation of vaccines is very topical at the moment as one approach to um, the ultimate uh, provision of protection against uh, viral diseases. Um, or bacterial diseases for that matter. And so I'm not going to go through in great detail the synthetic aspects, this has been published, but it involved preparing um, a, a selectively protected uh, manocide uh, uh, bioglycoside um, in such a way that it could be eventually converted to, first of all, a, di, a sort of pseudo disaccharide linked by a phosphate unit. So this mimics the the naturally occurring um, antigen in the in the or the repeating unit in the capsular polysaccharide. Um, so there's some interesting chemistry involved here, um, which, as I said, I won't go into the details because of time. Um, but we started by preparing the protected disaccharide or pseudo disaccharide, and then um, separately transformed the starting building block uh, to a an H phosphonate. Um, at the anomeric position, and then a protected uh, uh, phosphoester um, at the sixth position, in order to uh, introduce the second uh, phospho linkage at the sixth position of this unit over here. And um, so that led uh, the combination of those two units that I've just showed you, led to this trimer here, um, which could be processed further. Uh, as shown here, deprotected and so on. So the repeating, this represents a, a fragment uh, and oh, it's an analog. The repeating units itself uh, has monosaccharides linked one to six via phosphodiester bridge. Um, and this is in fact a slightly more stable analog and was designed really to, to uh, support the investigation of characteristics of an optimal glycoconjugate vaccine. So what, have, what did I learn from all of this other than the very interesting chemistry uh, involved here and the skills that are associated with synthetic chemistry? Well, what I want to take from this is that, and to encourage each of you, that we might not all in fact make the big discoveries. We might not ourselves uh, be the ones who discover the vaccine or the cure for COVID or for treating its symptoms. But each of us can contribute in small ways to building up uh, the scope of our science um, and providing foundations on which others can build. So although this project didn't particularly end in success in terms of contributing to a specific vaccine, it was a small step along the way for those involved in the vaccine development um, where they were able to evaluate whether or not this was uh, the, the optimal kind of unit to have. And I think we need to um, <clears throat> take encouragement from even the little bits that we can do and see them as a contribution, uh, which hopefully will be appreciated later on. The second lesson from, uh, the general lesson from my experience in carbohydrate comes from a, another topic, which uh, part of which I have discussed before in my visits to India, actually. So some of you who have been at conferences where I've been privileged to speak may have recall some of this, but I'd like to repeat it again here. Um, and in a sense to highlight uh, a lesson for particularly again the students uh, among us uh, today. Um, and it's a very simple and seemingly obvious thing, but take great care in interpreting your results and in your experiments. Uh, you should not underestimate the value of that. So the background to this was that we were trying to prepare uh, these particular conjugates of a thioglycoside of glucosamine, um, which were potential inhibitors um, of enzymes involved in the synthesis of mycothiol in the mycobacteria, the organisms uh, responsible for causing TB. <clears throat> and retrosynthetically, this uh, arises from, of course, the, the quinonoid unit uh, 
there and a, an amino acid uh, uh, terminated by a carboxyl group. So this is aspartic acid or glutamic acid. And then the um, a suitable sugar derivative with the free amine. So the synthesis, uh, just very quickly, um, goes via an interesting reaction which involves an oxidative decarboxylation of this acid to create a radical at the end of this chain, which then adds in a conjugate addition to the keto, the quinone here. And so you can form these uh, uh, substituted quinones here. And <clears throat> uh, just note uh, at this point, by the way, that we had this amine protected as its Bach derivative. We'll come back to that in a moment. Um, that could then be um, deprotected at the acid end uh, in preparation to uh, do a peptide coupling to the amino sugar using a suitable um, activator for the, the peptide bond formation. And using that, we were able to make uh, the peptide bond there and so on. And uh, basically, all that remained then was to remove the Bock protecting group and also the uh, protecting groups on the sugar. Um, we needed, by the way, this amine at this position because it was implicated in the binding to the active site of the enzyme. So the first step was just to remove the Bock, which is normally a simple procedure using uh, acidic conditions, trifluoroacetic acid. Um, room temperature four hours and we got a product in 70% yield which we assumed was this one and so here's where um, the lesson comes in because it's all very well writing chemistry down on paper and even a very relatively simple reaction like the deprotection of a Bach protecting group. Now typically and as you students will know this you monitor a reaction by TLC and we were puzzled by this because uh, when we ran TLCs and visualized them with various methods, we consistently saw no change uh, between the starting material and the product. So we were not even sure that the reaction had taken place. Um, and we tried uh, by UV, you could see these two spots, identical RF values. We changed the solvent systems and so on, and they were always exactly the same. So we weren't even sure if the reaction had been completed. We tried seric ammonium sulfate. And then eventually we kept trying and we decided we've got to keep looking at, uh, just to be uh, careful about this, uh, look at other visualizing agents. And we tried ferric chloride and, and lo and behold, uh, this showed up the product in an di entirely different color, a red color as opposed to a black spot uh, on charring. So clearly something had happened and to cut a long story short, we identified this product as opposed to the expected one, which would simply be the removal of this uh, protecting group here. Now we were able to rationalize this in, in retrospect um, because uh, there's the, the um, initial, we in fact assume that it, in fact the deprotection takes place, but immediately this amine finds itself uh, in a position to form a six membered ring and can attack that ketone there and condense to form the imine and then with the loss of uh, that proton there, it can aromatize completely to that product. So we have in fact confirmed this with a simpler case, uh, just with the benzyl group here, and we're able to get a crystal structure. And so that uh, was ultimately confirmed. So again, you can't be too careful until you've really interpreted the NMRs and assigned all the structures and so on. Um, but the lessons learned are keep questioning your observations, um, expect the unexpected, um, and remember that your experimental design or predictions could be wrong, and careful experimentation and observation is needed to test our knowledge and predictions. So this applies uh, as we do our studies now, but it equally applies as we, uh, to those uh, investigating significant problems like the COVID one. So in the final uh, section of this talk, I'm gonna to turn to natural products <coughs> and some experiences I've had along the way and what I've learned from them. So I suppose the broad question that we would want to consider now uh, during this uh, pandemic uh, COVID-19 uh, time is uh, can natural products deliver potential therapeutics? Is this one source to look for and uh, how would we go about looking for them and making sure that they work? So of course there are, uh, laboratories around the world doing this and you may have heard also that there are um, different uh, uh, examples of these which are being developed into some sort of uh, natural 
therapies. Um, you will have heard probably about the, the use of the Artemisia extract, and um, here's the curcumin, which was mentioned in the previous talk. And these are being investigated. Uh, sometimes, unfortunately, uh, claims are made which are not necessarily verified, and that, again, is part of our scientific responsibility to monitor. You will also be aware of a number of the, the drugs uh, that have been um, proposed as potential um, either cures for people uh, who have the COVID-19 or to alleviate symptoms. Uh, one of the most recent is dexamethasone. Uh, hydroxychloroquine, of course, has, has uh, had an interesting and rather sad uh, uh, story as associated with it recently. Um, this is uh, favipar river, uh, favipar river and remdesivir. I know that both of these, I think, are um, uh, uh, used in, in, in some situations in India at the moment. Um, now, these are not necessarily natural products, but they are certainly derived from natural products. Um, of course, hydroxychloroquine took its inspiration originally from quinine. <clears throat> And so, and there are, of course, numerous examples of uh, drugs which have been discovered in nature. How do we go about this? Well, briefly, let me give you some examples of my own experience. Um, one of my early experiences uh, was uh, looking at the plant Brunswickia radulosa, a very beautiful flowering plant. And we were able to use classical methods to isolate some alkaloids. I've just given two examples here. And, um, the, I mentioned here that we used classical methods, uh, acid-base extraction, flash chromatography, solvent partitioning. We found that these had modest activity against Plasmodium falciparum, which of course is the um, agent which uh, causes malaria, um, against both chloroquine-sensitive and chloroquine-resistant uh, strains. So there was some activity there. Without going into too many more of the de details, the, the lessons I learned from that, of course, were uh, there's nothing like um, natural products chemistry to improve your chemistry and spectroscopy skills. The process of isolating, purifying, characterizing, that is at the basis of our chemical science um, and determining structure. Um, and it's an essential uh, skill that we can offer in collaborations with others who are not chemists, but whose collaboration we need as well. Um, so what I, I realize, and others as well, of course, uh, is that there must be a better way. This is very laborious and time consuming to do all of this, to try and isolate a product. And the problem as anyone who's done natural products chemistry knows, is that a huge amount of time and effort and money uh, goes into this and often you end up simply rediscovering a known natural product and you seem to waste a lot of time. And the, the simple question is, and particularly in a crisis period like this, how can we as quickly as possible home in on novel um, uh, structures or indeed identify very quickly whether some interesting molecule which might already be known is present in, in a plant? So that is what I set out to do in the latter part of my experience in um, natural products. And uh, we started asking questions about modern technologies for separation and structure determination, which could overcome the limitations of this classic approach and speed up drug discovery. And I was also interested to know whether how we should go about uh, studying natural products and, and to the extent to which we should uh, interact and engage with the plants and the people who use the plants um, rather than simply uh, stealing them out from under their noses. And so uh, I set out and, and learned lessons in interdisciplinary collaboration as well as techniques for dereplication, which is another word for uh, the sorting out uh, of complex mixtures to identify known compounds before you even uh, isolate them. So I in, uh, assembled an interdisciplinary team I just mentioned this in my interesting experience. This is a philosopher of science, a social anthropologist, myself, a botanist, um, a student, a PhD, three PhD students, one of them doing social anthropology, who helped us uh, in our interaction with the communities where these plants. There were, of course, a number of chemists involved. And we, we studied plants in an area in the northwest part of South Africa, about 400 kilometers from uh, the southern point of Cape Town. Uh, where my botanist friend had done a lot of work 
Uh, why there? Well, there's a high biodiversity. Um, lots of plants occur only there and nowhere else in the world. High level of endemism, various a few particular families of flowering plants. And it's a very particular um, area called the succulent Karoo, one of two deserts to be recognized uh, in the top 25 priority conservation. So we thought it would be interesting to study those plants. We went up there. This is what it looks like. Uh, in some of the regions, reasonably dry but beautiful flowering plants. And I'm going to go through this fairly quickly because part of our efforts were to interact with the local communities. Here I am talking to uh, uh, Wum Kuiki, his name is, who was one of the traditional healers, had a tremendous knowledge of the local plants and who was willing um, to discuss with us some of the insights that he could bring. And obviously, we were very careful to honor and respect his knowledge and, can, um, uh, and, and give due um, recognition to that. Um, we studied a range of plants. We looked at them at different times of the year, um, between uh, different seasons, to try and monitor uh, the um, occurrence of active metabolites, whether it was consistent across seasons and so on. So I'm going to skip through this fairly quickly, but you can see the very colorful um, uh, very beautiful uh, plants that we dealt with. Um, we then set about the more the dereplication, so LCMS traces, for example, with this extract of Crass Brevifolia, allowed us, e even from the NM, um, mass spectral data, to identify uh, some natural products uh, using the databases that are available around the world. So one can feed in the LCMS data into databases and you can identify that it has large quantities, for example, of catechin, which is a known natural product, and so we know we don't have to go and try and uh, isolate that again. Of course, we use classic procedures like mass spectrometry and NMR, and we were able to make use of three-dimensional maps um, of retention time versus uh, molecular mass, atomic mass, and of course the intensity to get an idea of the array of compounds. And uh, again, by using databases, identify quite a number of these components without even needing to extract them. So what did we finally settle on? Um, what else did I learn? And I'll just uh, spend uh, one or two more minutes, if I may, uh, Professor Curry. Um, we need to follow the advances in science. Uh, in science. And uh, so we've continued to try and do this and in search for bioactive compounds from novel bacteria. And I just want to really um, quickly highlight uh, one important aspect of this. So this comes from a soil sample right down here near Cape Town a new bacterium, Crebella spavoni. And we went through the classic uh, procedures, including solvent partitioning, preparative HPLC, and generating LC and high resolution mass spec profiles of the whole extracts. We did isolate some compounds, but we were also able to look at the overall LC trace with all of these different components. And again, utilizing uh, mass spec and um, NMR equipment, but also feeding into a very interesting um, project, which I'd like to highlight and recommend to you, which seems to me a, an important um, contribution in this particular time. It's a, a approach called Global Natural Products Social Molecular Networking. And it really, it's a bringing together of a whole lot of data banks of mass spectral data on natural products, um, and metabolomics uh, resources and so on, where members of the scientific community uh, for free can contribute their mass spec information and compare it to existing. Particularly when you have MSMS data, you can compare your fragmentation with a whole, uh, with thousands and thousands of compounds and potentially end up as we did with identifying compounds which are similar to each other represented by nodes here um, and you can get a series of structures as we did, and these are a series of uh, what are referred to as siderophores. They are iron chelating compounds found in plants. And uh, we were able there in that way to end, uh, identify some new compounds, which some of them which we isolated, but others which we didn't even isolate. Some of them were existing compounds, some were new. So we didn't isolate this, but we could tell from the fragmentation patterns that this is what we have. So 
let me finish. Um, what are the lessons learned? Well, the science of chemistry and the skills have given us the capability of making great progress, and it, we need to use these wisely and humbly in the service of humanity. Uh, we need to take a note of the significant developments in instrumentation and the capacity to handle large sets of data and information. And if you put that together with a spirit of collaboration and working together to solve problems, then there are indeed exciting opportunities. And those of you who are younger have a choice to uh, really get into this in an exciting way. We've also been brought to our knees and humbled by a tiny virus, let's face that. Uh, it's, it's having a particularly devastating effect on the most vulnerable members of our communities, aged and the poor. But we can recover and strengthen if we learn to work together, as I've emphasized, and are willing to set aside parochial, selfish interests in favor of collectively solving our problems. So with those thoughts, um, I thank you once again very much for the opportunity. I acknowledge uh, a number of collaborators here, some of whom are pictured, and uh, thank you very much for your attention. And thanks again to Professor Kari and his team for organizing this.